Shalom everyone, Shalom um, watchmen from the different parts of uh, the world. We are here right now in the city of Thessaloniki in Greece, the second largest city in Greece, the capital of the territory of Macedonia. And uh, tomorrow, we're gonna, uh, early in the morning, we're going to film the last of our project uh, this time of Bible Lands Unveiled. We're going to teach from Acts chapter 17, the first nine verses, and we are going to look into First and Second Thessalonians. And the title of uh, the message tomorrow um, is, uh, is basically going to be, Are You Turning the World Upside Down? We're talking about the role of the believers and the fact that both um, Paul and Silas were accused for turning the world upside down. And uh, we're going to try and understand what is it, what weapon did they use to turn the world upside down? And what was it that they were preaching? And what is it that we need to hold on to? So that is going to be tomorrow and I'm very, very excited. But let's uh, start right now with a... Um, a um, statement that I want to give to all of you, statement um, regarding my uh, understanding of the role of the believers in light of current world events. And it has to be extremely, it has to be clear that um, what we're going to report later on, on the events of the last few hours in Syria, is not criticizing anyone and it's not passing judgment on anyone. I will report what happened because I believe you deserve to know the truth. But I will also tell you that I'm at confidence and, and peace and um, I, I have the joy of the Lord and the hope that, that we need to hold on to um, because I understand my role in this whole picture and we all need to understand that as well. So before we start honing our swords and before we start stabbing each other online, why don't we first look into um, our role? So first of all, I would like all of you to understand that as a Bible believer, I am convinced that our world is operating in two different or parallel lines. I believe that there are the world events and there is our life in this world and I believe that these particular um, uh, two lines for the rest of the world don't really exist they don't think about it the world truly believes that through actions that world leaders can take they're going to change the world for better and um, and some believers even believe that through prayers they can stop things that the Bible say are going to happen. So I believe that things are much more complicated for us as believers because um, not only that we know what is going to happen, but also we understand the end from the beginning as God gave us um, um, the ability and He communicated through His prophets the end from the beginning. He gave us the understanding, only if we believe, only if we, we read, only if we take the time and, and we ponder into those things. He, he, he gave us the understanding. It is important to me that you understand. It is important for me that you understand, ladies and gentlemen, that for example, if the Bible says that the Antichrist is going to come to the world, you can fast until next week the Antichrist is going to come to the world, period. And if the Bible says that Russia is going to come and Iran is going to come and Turkey is going to come and attack Israel, you can pray that it's not going to happen, but guess what? It will happen. And the reason it will happen is not because God is not listening to the prayers. It's because God knows the hearts of the leaders. God knows before they decided what they're about to decide, and He knows their heart. Just as he knew what Pharaoh is going to say to, to, to Moses before Moses even got to Pharaoh's chamber and, and, and shared with him, 
God also told us already through His prophets the things that are about to come. Now you can, you know, you can imagine that uh, the same thing was there in the time of Jesus. You know, you you could. We must remember people that are running to the battlefield and and kill. So as a watchman, talking to other watchmen and watchwomen all around the world, I want you to uh, understand that um, this is our important role. This is our important role, to be watchmen. And, um, and I, by the way, I do understand there are inter interruptions. I do understand that more than five times so far. The internet stopped here, and, and, but I'm, I'm, I hope that I'm back online and I'm just telling you, ladies and gentlemen, in this whole political, um, military mayhem that we find ourselves right now, we must not forget that God is allowing things to happen. And He knows that ego and power and, and, and is the main thing that drives leaders around the world. And He understands that um, what eventually is going to happen will also serve his interest. In other words, God can turn all of those bad things into great things, just as He did 2,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago. The, all the hatred towards Israel, even in, in the last 80 years, um, brought about the birth of the nation of Israel back in the land and brought about the return of the Jews back to their land. So there are so many things that we need to keep in mind that God is allowing to happen for a reason. And we, as watchmen on the walls, are watching, and we are warning, and we are praying, and we are fasting, and we are interceding, and we are standing firm, and we understand that our hope is not the leaders of this world, our hope is not the military in this world, our hope is not the politicians in this world, our hope is not the money in this world, our hope is not the riches of this world, our hope is our Messiah. He is our hope. And it's interesting because the very beginning of that glimpse of hope came to the mind of Peter when he realized that the resurrection was something real. When he realized Jesus indeed is alive. That's when he changed completely. So we need to hold on to that. And we need to understand that the resurrected Lord that is seated at the right hand of the Father into seats for us and is about to come back and take us. This is our hope. So when we are about to dive into world events right now, we must keep in mind that even if leaders, because he knows the way they talk, he knows the way they think, he knows the things that drive them, and he is warning us about this. So it must remember, I'm not passing judgment, and I'm not true. Most, again, most of what you hear in the news regarding the events of the last few hours is not completely true. You must remember that. Now, let me to reconnect many times. Guys, I, I understand it's interrupt, the, the, the broadcast is interrupted. But I'm just going to press forward. So, after I said that, why don't we go back a week ago. Today is Saturday. A week ago Saturday, we had a chemical attack in the city of Duma, in the northern part of Ruta, which is a suburb of Damascus. This is something that is not refuted. We know that it happened. We know that predominantly chlorine was used. We know that it killed a lot of people that because they were already sitting in bomb shelters and even a small amount of chlorine could have killed people that are close in a very close room. And we know that um, the, the, um, um, uh, the uh, number of casualties passed 150 people and the pictures were horrific and we have uh, proofs that that happened such as we have proof that many events like that happened in the last eight years more than 50 different times make mo make no mistake now you need to understand that following that event there was an airstrike and the airstrike was in t4 in uh, in that airbase uh, in the heart of Syria 
In, in the beginning, people thought that this is an American attack on Syria, and then, of course, everybody changed their mind, and the, the fingers were pointing at Israel. Israel, of course, never said a word, but let me tell you something, you and I know Israel did it. But what you don't know is why Israel did it, and what Israel tried to achieve in it. And I will tell you one thing, it has absolutely nothing to do with the chemical attack per se. The chemical attack gave us the justification that we can do it right now. But what we did five days ago was not a retaliation to the chemical attack. We, we left that one to the American president who already promised a year ago that if chemical weapon will be used, he is going to respond. And we respected that. But now let me take you all the way back, ladies and gentlemen, to February 10, 2018. Early, early morning, a drone made in Iran is making his way all the way into the territory of Israel, south of the Sea of Galilee, and is about to penetrate into Israeli airspace. In fact, it does cross the border, and Israel shoots it down. We use Apache helicopter to shoot it down. Within a couple hours, we destroy the control caravan that uh, operated it in the same T-4 air, air base um, in Syria. Um, a chain of events led to the shooting down of an Israeli plane or the, uh, or the um, injury of Israeli pilot, a, a, an Israeli um, uh, weasel. Uh, in one of our F-16s and, and the necessity to abandon the airplane uh, right above Upper Galilee in Israel. It all led to Israel destroying a third of Syria's air defense systems within a few minutes. All of that it was only because of one thing. Ladies and gentlemen, listen now carefully. Listen now carefully. When we examine that drone, we realized that the Iranians were not just sending a drone for reconnaissance purposes. The drone carried explosive. The drone was supposed to enter into Israel and explode. It was supposed to be a terrorist attack made in or made by Iran on Israeli soil using the latest technology. And we were shocked that Iran boldly did so when they know that Israel is not tolerating their entrenchment in Syria. Now, I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, it took us two months to gather all the intelligence we needed. Actually, it took us way less than that, but we waited for the right moment. And we realized that in that same T-4 airbase, there is one hangar. And in that hangar, there are only Iranian people. This is a secret um, program of the Iranian regime within Syria where they assemble those drones, where they are um, loading them with um, a weapon, and where they are testing on them different types of weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, it has to be very clear. Israel did not destroy any Syrian target. Israel destroyed an Iranian target of one of the most top secret programs of the Iranian um, Revolutionary Guard. They were shocked, they were angry, they were humiliated, and if anything, they were also very confused. Who in the world spilled the beans? Who in the world gave the Israelis the information that that is going on there? Ladies and gentlemen, Israel did not warn them in advance. Israel did not tell the Russians in advance. Israel did not tell them what targets were about to hit. We went there and we took care of business and they were furious. But remember, the attack that Israel performed five days ago had absolutely nothing to do, per se, with the chemical attack. We just used the moment where some sort of reaction was expected, and we immediately attacked where we should have attacked maybe a month ago, and we couldn't because of um, other issues that were on the table. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel destroyed the Iranian hangar within Syria. Iran, for the first time, said that Iranian soldiers died. For the first time, Iran was publicly admitting that they are in Syria. 
And for the first time, Iran basically said to the world, the fears of the Israelis that we are deeply entrenched in Syria are basically true. We are there and we're using it in order to attack Israel. That what happened five days ago. So we must understand what happened then. And, and, <clears throat> and now I'm, and, and, and remember one thing, now it's not, I'm not sitting in a nice comfortable chair somewhere in Texas or somewhere in Vancouver or somewhere in Brisbane. I am miles away from Iranian soldiers that are plotting to destroy me and kill my family. So you must understand the way the Israelis think is what is the message that we send to our neighbors when we do something? What is the level of, of um, um, fear that we put in them when we do something. That's the way the Israelis think. And what I'm about to tell you right now is from an Israeli perspective of an Israeli person, not from any other thing. Okay, I will start from the very end. Let me start with Trump's, uh, President Trump's uh, speech to the nation a few hours ago when he declared that America is, a, is launching a strike on Syria. And he said the following thing. He said, looking around our very troubled world, Americans have no illusions. We cannot purge the world of evil or act everywhere. There is tyranny. And he is right. And then he said, no amount of American blood or treasure can produce lasting peace and security in the Middle East. And he is right. It's troubled place, and we will try to make it better, but it is a troubled place. The United States will be a partner and a friend, but, listen to this right now, the, faith, the fate of the re region lies in the hands of its own people. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm an Israeli. I'm a, 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 a uh, commander in the Israeli army, ex-commander, I'm no longer now there. And I, I was taught to read between the lines. When you hear a message like this, you also read between the lines. And when you read between the lines, you read basically this. Israel, we cross fingers. We will support you all the way. However, we will not directly intervene in any campaign or war against Iran as long as there is no usage of non-conventional weapon. The line that was drawn is simple. Assad can butcher his people and bomb them and kill hundreds of thousands. The intervention of the international community will only be if chemical, biological or nuclear weapon will be used. That's it. So, for example, if a drone loaded with explosive is about to fly towards Israel, and Israel has to attack, and Israel has to take care of business. No one is going to help us here. No one is going to back us up. No one is going to stand there for us because it is within the limitation of conventional weapon. Israel understood that. Now, you have to understand, we fully support President Trump. The Prime Minister of Israel about an hour ago issued a statement, Israel is standing firmly behind President Trump and the United States of America and its decision to attack. But now, let's try and understand what is it exactly that America truly attacked. So, I hope you're ready to understand the truth. The truth sometimes hurts. And again, I'm not passing judgment and I'm not, I'm not trying to uh, criticize anything. Maybe if I was President Trump, I would have decided the same thing. Maybe if I was an American uh, politician, I would have decided the same thing. I am only now giving you the information based on facts and based on what happened. And it's not for us to judge. Remember, being watchmen, and we have to understand, we have to stop stabbing each other online and butcher each other online. We have to understand our role is not to criticize this politician or that politician. Our role is to be watchmen and to warn people of that 
that we know that is about to come. So I'm going to start with April 7th, uh, of course, the uh, Saturday famous um, chemical attack. On April 8th, the, one of the only world leaders that openly spoke against what happened and was upheld by what, what happened and was shocked by what happened was President Trump. Of all people, he was shocked. He blamed Russia and Iran for supporting the animal Assad. He said that they will pay dear price. And he, he wrote on the very same day that if Obama would have then stood on those red lines, things like that would have not happened. And Assad would have been history. The personal involvement of President Trump was surprising. We, when we read his tweets and we heard his comments, we even as Israelis were surprised. We were amazed. That, uh, that is the same president that days earlier said that he intends to pull out his soldiers from, Iran, from uh, Syria. So we were amazed. And by the way, I believe, I believe that he was truly expressing his feelings. If, I remember I saw the pictures of those, of those children, of those families. I was shocked. I was appalled. I, I understand what he felt when he saw this. And not only that, when America was trying to tell the Russians, open the area for ambulances to come in, open the area for people to, to be evacuated, nothing was done. In fact, the Syrian regime locked it up, which gave the president even more assurances that it was Assad. According to the Wall Street Journal, and by the way, beyond that, according to sources that I know, the authentic intention of President Trump was to completely destroy the government and the military infrastructures of Assad and allow a tipping point in this war for the rebels to be able to take over and to also make sure that the Iranians and the Russians are going to pay the price and that that axis of evil is going to get hit hard. Ladies and gentlemen, from the moment those words came out of the mouth of President Trump, the axis of evil was shocked and was on the defense. That was his authentic and original pr plan. I believe it. I honestly believe it and I, 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 I know this is the man. Now, April 9, a day after, John Bolton became officially the um, national security advisor to, to President Trump. And his approach was very, very, very um, strong, um, just like Trump. He, he, he stood behind him and his will to get the, a very heavy price from Bashar al-Assad, from the Russians, and from the Iranians. Bolton agreed that there has to be a very large-scale bombing on the infrastructures. Guys, I'm not a bloodthirsty person. I don't want civilians to die. I don't want children to die. That's why we need to put an end to all of this. We are talking about destroying infrastructures that belong to the military. And watch what happened. We, Bolton was thinking, just like Trump thought, that that will not only remember, it was North Korea in the mind of Trump when he, when he talked the way he talked also uh, to the Russians and, and the Iranians. It was then, on April 9, that the administration leaked that within 24 to 48 hours, there will be a strike. The, that was, we all remember that. It was um, interesting because the first meeting that the uh, American had, um, basically, um, the first meeting that the, the, the military leaders had, they received instructions for possible, to give a list of possible um, uh, targets. And ladies and gentlemen, the Pentagon got panicked. And I, I'm not passing judgment here. I'm telling you, the Pentagon got panicked. 
And the, the military establishment, by the way, that is there is, for the most part, from the days of Obama. You must realize that. And um, they were very much against large-scale attack and anything that will be um, toppling or destabilizing Bashar al-Assad. April 10, ladies and gentlemen, James Mattis was called to the White House. Um, and he, he's actually, excuse me, he called himself to the White House. <laughs> and he, he rushed to the White House in order to stop the intention for a large-scale attack. He's bringing with him the chief of the Joint Staff, Joseph Dan, uh, Dunford. They come to President Trump. They scare him and tell him that there will be a world war. He will be the one that will be perceived as the responsible for it. Iran can open an attack on American forces in the Persian Gulf. And President Trump is finding it very hard to stand against all those generals, his top generals, who also remind him, hey, we need to withdraw from Syria. Again, if I was in the shoes of President Trump, hearing all these things from my own generals, I probably would have taken the same decision. At the same time, Ladies and gentlemen, England and France are basically telling America that they will only take part of any strike, providing that it will be on the very chemical installations and with, listen to me now, with coordination with the Russians. Ladies and gentlemen, Russia is frightening Europe. And the Europeans are scared. They see what the Russians are doing in the UK and what the Russians are doing elsewhere, and they're scared. So they said to President Trump, if you want us in, we do not attack anything but one, two, or three targets, and we must collaborate and inform the Russians. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now having great discussion all around and they receive a decision to bomb the chemical installations and some of the airfields, some of the military air bases, the two main military air bases. Now, I don't know if you know that, but Russia and the U.S. have some sort of uh, communication um, that Trump decides to give up on the big plan. He also agreed to let the Russian know the time and the location of the bombing so they can pull out their people and no Russian casualties will be there. And the Americans knew at that point that the Russians will tell the Syrians that. And Mattis actually was interested in it. Bashar al-Assad already on April 10, gets the um, information from the Russians. Listen, the Americans are going to do it. So start evacuating your air bases and all of your chemical substances from your storages. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Bashar al-Assad had more than two and a half days to not only evacuate airplanes from air bases, but also to empty all of his storehouses from those chemical substances. And he just did that. All of the installations that America bombed were empty buildings. There was nothing there. They were ready to be bombed, believe it or not. Which, by the way, left in the hands of Bashar his chemical uh, capability because the substances are in his hands. They're just changed location. On April 11, Trump understands that his people got to an agreement with the Russians that rockets are going to fly. And then, only then he's tweeting, Russia get ready, the rockets will come, beautiful, new, and smart. By the way, he was right. He was right. At this point, he knows that the
the Russians will not be attacked and will not also shoot down the rockets. In fact, the opposite. The Americans and Russians are fully coordinated on the day and the location of the strike. April 12, today, the big battle day. Ladies and gentlemen, the Security Council is gathering in Washington. President Trump is sitting there with his different advisors that are pulling him to different directions. Mattis remind him of his commitment to pull out of the Middle East. Bolton tells him that he must hit Bashar al-Assad and the Russians. And it is secretly decided that today is the day and it has to be done in a late hour of the day and the Russians were informed. But this is, by the way, where some turn is happening. Mattis comes and stop the attack once again. And he's saying on April 12th that he is against the attack as is. We're not to bomb also two other air bases. And the bombing is delayed once again. April 13, the White House is telling the world, we haven't received a decision yet about their strike in Syria, which by the way was true. In light of all that was going on behind the scenes, the Russian understand of the great hesitation in the, um, on the American side. By the way, the Russians are afraid that this is a trap. They're afraid that the Americans are saying one thing, but they're going to do another thing. But then the following day, they will understand that they gave the Americans too big of a credit. And they, the Americans decide to no longer continue with the plan to hit two of those air bases. April 14, which is today, early in the morning, 4.30 a.m., for the next 45 minutes, we are going to have 110 missiles fired from American B-1, American frigate, French frigate, French aircraft, Mirage, and four tornado air jets, uh, jet fighters uh, that uh, the, Brit the British sent from their royal base in Cyprus. Ladies and gentlemen, this 45 minutes long bombing shocked the Syrians. Why? You want to know why? Because the minute it was over, they realized nothing happened to Syria. Few empty buildings were destroyed. And also, you understand that they realize that the Americans are rushing to say, hey, we, just, we stopped, it was a one-time thing, we're done, don't expect anything else, that's it, it's over. The Syrians were looking at one another, the Russians were smiling, the Iranians were smiling, and everybody in the Middle East, now, Bear in mind, listen, if I was President Trump, I may have probably done the same thing. In his own doctrine, he doesn't want to stay in the Middle East, and I totally understand him. I started this whole, this whole report by reading his statement. He understands he cannot change the Middle East. He is right, he cannot change the Middle East. But you, you must understand that all the declarations of victory are false and fake if anything happened is this both Assad and the Russians and the Iranians and the North Koreans by the way understand that there is a big gap between what a president say and what a president can do now, Israel, by the way, respect President Trump 
for what he did. Don't get me wrong. I'm just giving you what the Middle East countries are looking and seeing and the way they interpret it. You must understand the way they interpret that is the way that will determine the, how they will respond in the future. And now comes your role as watchmen on the walls, as believers. Stop thinking that politicians are going to solve the problems of the world. Stop thinking that military might and power is going to fix everything. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we should trust in the name of the Lord, the Bible says. Psalm 20. We must remember with all the greatest intention that President Trump has. And by the way, I believe that he has. I believe that he has great intentions. He will not be able to fix it. He already admitted that this morning. I will not be able to fix the Middle East. It's a troublesome area. And eventually the fate of the region will have to be determined by the people there. And he is right. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel is bracing right now towards something else. The Iranians vowed to avenge the Israeli attack on their people in Syria. Everybody understand that the exercise of power is over. Everybody understand that Israel, if Israel has to act, Israel will have to think 50,000 times now before it does something. And just about a few hours ago, the Russians are saying, uh, we think that we need to sell the Syrians the S-300 batteries because um, we see that they need protection. The world, Israel, persuaded the Russians not to do that for, for the longest time. Now the Russians are going to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, we must understand that it's not criticizing anyone. I know that in some Israeli news sites, Mattis is, is, is the target. Because, I mean, they all say that, you know, Mattis is not a great is lover of Israel to begin with and all of that. I, I'm not even going there. To me, it's not about Mattis. And it's not about President Trump. And it's not about... I know that what happened in Syria is just the beginning. And I know that Syria will have to pay a price of the aggression that comes out of it towards Israel. And I know that Damascus will be destroyed. And I know that the Russians and the Iranians, they know we can't come against America, but we can surely come against Israel. And when that happens, trust me, those same Turks that blessed Trump for doing what he did, will jump on that wagon and they will definitely join the party. My point today is very clear. We must understand that what happened, but when the dust settles from all that happened this week, everybody must remember one thing and it has to be very clear. Israel understands today more than ever before that Israel is standing alone against that aggression. And we, <laughs> thank God Ezekiel records that God is going to come and help us because no other country will. And that is the beauty of all of these things. And for us, the believers, gear up, buckle up, get ready, because our redemption indeed is drawing near. We have monsters on the other side of the border. They want to destroy us. If they destroy their own people so easily, how much more they can destroy us without having any trouble. I want to tell you something. They still have chemical capability and they still have the intention to destroy us. But the God of Israel is going to intervene. And he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And all that I reported today, if there is, if there is one thing that I, I, I wish to convey to all of you today, is that bashing each other online and stabbing each other online is not going to honor any, any, any Messiah. <laughs> it's not going to give honor to God and it's not even right. Because we're not to begin with. 
put our trust that world leaders will save us from anything. You must also understand that watchmen on the walls are not out there in the battlefield. They are watching and they are warning. This is what is our job all about. And don't leave your position as watchmen and go down and start killing your own people. Don't leave your position and start bashing each other. Let's understand that in these days that we have to tell everyone of the Lord and of the hope that we have in His coming, how do we look like when we hate each other, when we, when we attack each other? How do we look like when we're standing and we are looking worse than the world? I believe with all of my heart that we live in the last hour. These are not just the last days. I believe with all of my heart that we don't want to run this race in vain. I believe that people who live this life as believers and never share the gospel and they don't do that. They run the race in vain. As Paul says, I'm afraid lest I run in vain. I, I'm sharing the gospel lest I run in vain. I believe that with all of my heart, put those swords of hatred down. Take your Bibles. Find your comfort and hope in the Scriptures. And remember, the Lord is coming soon. And He wants to find His bride ready. Ready, ready, ready. Thank you for listening. I know that there were a lot of technical difficulties on this broadcast. We're going to put it on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, do that. Behold Israel. Follow me on YouTube, on Instagram, Behold Israel, one word. Subscribe to our newsletter, beholdisrael.org. That's our website to subscribe. And um, we want to continue giving you unfiltered, honest reporting of world events. But we're not news agency. We want to see people coming to Christ. We want to see people getting saved. And we want to see those who already believe in Him encouraged. Getting that hope that they need to have. Because the coming of the Lord to take his bride is very, very near. And allow me to finish with uh, the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai Vishmerecha. Yaer Adonai Panavelecha Vichuneka. Yisa Adonai Panavelecha Vyasemlecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you all and keep you. May the Lord shine His face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance towards you and give you peace. Shalom. That peace that surpasses all understanding, that can only come from the Lord of Peace, the Prince of Peace, who can give you peace now and all times, here and everywhere. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you and God bless you and be strong and I will be here to report next week or if anything else happen in between you can be uh, sure that I'll uh, give a special update but if not most likely next Saturday same place same time not same place <laughs> I'll be in Israel but about the same time Shabbat Shalom thank you and God bless